Oh, nice. Yeah, four power. Yeah, almost five. All right. We covered rotational systems last time. Um, I'm not going to go too much into rotational systems because at this point, um, we haven't covered modeling yet. Technically, everything we've done up until this point has been review because you should have already learned that material. None of this should be new to you. Okay. Now, we're going to be transitioning out of review. So, so we're going to be transitioning out of review and into knowledge, okay? Welcome to knowledge. Yep, I drop it fast, I drop it hot, and then I pop it and then I lock it. And I locked it. I'll lock that learning into play. I'm trying to. There it is. There we go. That's my hot spot. There we go. Okay. What do you know about systems or controls so far that you've learned in this class? They work together. They're, they exist. Yeah. That's why they're, par they're partnered together for reason. Parentheses S. They have purpose in life. We haven't really talked about systems or controls yet. This is week three. We haven't even talked about the, the name of the course. So, we have some catch-up work to do to figure out what it is that we're actually doing. And I'm joking there because we've, we've been talking about it just more subliminally. Okay. What is a system? Huh? I think this is like day one stuff because I briefly covered it. To perform a function. <laughs> okay. So when it comes to defining a system, that's a, that's a pretty broad definition there. Hey, if you look at your table, your table is a bunch of components that all work together to, to perform a function, right? Is a table a system? Yes. Heck, heck yeah, everything is a system, everything. Everything. Everything is a system, all right? everything. So we've now reached this place where we're, this class isn't really one specific topic for a specific type of engineer. It's most closely associated with electrical engineering. However, this class is intended for everyone because every type of scientist has to deal with systems. That's not just engineers. That is every scientist. You're dealing with systems that comprise of multiple components, all doing unique, independent functions. It's a lot of words, and I am not writing down on this board, so you can feel free to paraphrase me in your notes. Okay, so when it comes to understanding systems, it is very critical that we understand this because everything is a system. You can have a, if anything that performs a function is what I should say. So let me, let me, a little bit of a redaction there.
Okay? Everything that's useless, we don't even care about. Anything that doesn't perform a function, anything that's just there for aesthetics, we aren't going to consider that part of the system. We're focused on functionality. Okay? What does it mean to perform a function? We're getting into some philosophy here. Oh, wow, you went straight for the jugular there. You like ruined five minutes of lecture. Fine, we'll just, we'll, we'll just skip all of that nice expository I'd planned. Go straight to Jeremyville. Population Jeremy and the rest of us. <sighs> you shut up. <laughs> <sighs> when you perform a function as a system, you're taking some kind of input, and this may be multiple inputs, and converts it to some kind of output, and there may be multiple outputs. Okay? Well, we gotta, we gotta keep playing this definition game. This is what it means to perform a function. This is what a system is. But now we've introduced input and output. What is an input? Well, this one's a little bit more abstract and we're starting to get to the point of what this class is, okay? An input is a physical property or a piece of information entered into a system. Okay? Well, we can keep playing this definition game. What does it mean to enter into a system? Well, it could either be pre-programmed or, or it could be something like you push a button and that's a way of saying here, do this. It could be something where uh, a physical property, this is something that where it comes into a system. This could be as much as your car tire hitting a bump. This could be anything like uh, an airflow hitting a wall or traveling through a mesh. There's a very broad definition here. Okay, and we can do the same for an output. Here, this is also a physical property or a piece of information that result that, that, uh, that can be extracted from a system as a result of the system behavior. Okay. Well, that's interesting. I'm going to I'm going to introduce one more term. Behavior. <laughs> because this this is a never-ending string of defining definitions of definitions. What does it mean when I say system behavior? Well, here this begins to become redundant because I'm going to define it in terms of this. How a system converts input to output. This is also known as processing. especially in computerized systems. All 
I drew a diagram for you. Uh, I think day one of class. This is the basic diagram of a system, okay? In a system, you have some kind of an input, it does something, and you get some kind of an output. Nice. All right. One more definition, because I might as well throw it in now. What does it mean to control? Anybody want to take a guess at this one? Control the behavior. I like how you phrased that. No. Although you use the word in the definition, so shame on you. But that's the idea. The importance of control is that it has everything to do with behavior. If you can control the behavior, what you're doing is you're controlling the output. So control is optimization. Optim, yep, nope, that's an I. Optimus prime. Optimus prime. Optimus. There we go. Optimization of system behavior to tune the system output. Okay? That's the idea behind control. When I turn on a light switch, I'm providing an input to a system, but I'm not actually providing a control to the system because I am not doing anything to change the system behavior. If I shut off that light switch, it goes back and does what it did before I turn the light on. There's no control there. I don't actually have control over these lights. I don't have control over most things in this room. Now the importance of control systems uh, are, and I, I've said this before in this class, most modern innovation that's happening right now is in the field of systems and controls. And I would say most major modern innovation right now. These are systems for how we can get power because, uh, I mean, California just announced massive rolling blackouts as they're struggling with power. That's the control that they are exercising in order to try to deal with this input-output issue, the system behavior, okay? We still haven't gotten power management down and it's friggin' 2022. We went through two world wars and like 15 pandemics and we're still trying to figure out how to put power into a city. It's a modern problem. People are trying to come up with self-driving cars. People are trying to come up with intelligent buildings. People are trying to consume less energy. People are trying to get more productivity out of their manufacturing equipment and out of their workers. People are trying to do better sports science. That's a systems and controls problem. People are trying to rehabilitate better. That's another systems and controls problem. What we have here is most of the, what I will say, most of the major innovations right now are happening in systems and controls because this is such a difficult to understand concept. I told you this isn't very, this isn't taught very well in schools. I'm going to try, I'm changing how this course is taught because I want to make it useful to you in your future. If I were to teach this way, it's mostly taught we could cover everything that you, that you would find useful in this class in about a week. It means we have 14 weeks of, I don't know, throwing things at each other. 
or making fun of Zach for playing Xbox. <laughs> yeah, you thought it was over. It wasn't over. You made one too many snide comments yesterday. <laughs> uh, but realistically speaking, if you can understand this, this is not hard for you to make real changes in the world right now. Right now. Find something you're interested in it. Take principles you're learning from this class, apply it to it. You will already be on the cutting edge of technology. Like that, bam. Okay? So this is really, an, it is a very important class, but it's also kind of a, a very abstract class in that regard. Um, and just bear with me because we've got to get through a little bit of abstract in order to get to where we're headed. So now that we understand the system, let's talk about a couple of examples. Let's use our definitions in some things that we've already learned in this class or really already reviewed in this class. Try to better understand what a system is. Okay, here's an example. Oh yeah, circuits again. Okay, is this a system? This is a system. Is this system have an output. Uh, what is it? It does output heat. Okay, so, so we can go here and we can talk about power consumed by the resistor as an output. Nice. Is there anything else that this system outputs? Capacitor to store charge. So what you end up with is some amount of electrical field energy that gets generated. So we could call that an output. Does anything else happen in this system? It doesn't really generate electricity, it consumes it. Not quite generating. The inductor is going to put out a magnetic field. P. I think, yeah, I think that's, we're going to call it L for inductor. Okay. So we do have some outputs from the system. In fact, I'm going to go ahead and write down every single output we could have from the system. We could have an output of the system be the current that goes to the resistor. IR. We could also have it be the voltage that goes to the resistor, VR. We could just straight up go ahead and multiply those two together and have that be the power going out of the resistor, or as Duncan said, that's the heat generated by the system, PR. We could also have current going through the capacitor. We could also have voltage across the capacitor. We could also have the power consumed by the capacitor that eventually turns into the, electron, uh, the electric field. We could also have the current going through the inductor. We could also have the voltage going through the inductor. And lastly, we can have the power going through the conductor. All of those are outputs. I'm gonna go ahead and put out one more. What is this? No, it's not this communist symbol. It is a poorly drawn Molotov cocktail. Get it right. I'm getting demonetized on YouTube now. Thank you. No. As much as I want to scrounge around and get a couple pennies off of these videos, you guys aren't worth that much. 
Your edu the ed educational experience I'm providing you, I'm not gonna monetize it, because that sounds dumb. It's not worth it anything to me to try to make money off, like a couple pennies off of every lecture video, and then every time you go to watch that video, you have to go through five ads. That sounds like a, a, a nightmare. And I might make a couple pennies off of it. <laughs> Eventually, but it's not worth it to me. I would rather you have a better educational experience, personally. <laughs> what is this? It's Tau. What is Tau? <laughs> Done. This is a time constant. <laughs> Which in this case, actually, I don't know what tau is. Because this isn't a typical RLC circuit. But here, time constant would be how long is it going to take to reach equilibrium? Nice. OK. So we have a lot of outputs here. Do we have any inputs? What? VC? VS. Here, the input that we've explicitly stated is VS because this is a voltage source, but we are also inputting IS, PS ultimately. Although, IS is something that is a resultant of the system behavior. And as a result, so is PS. Now hold up. I drew that nice little diagram that was like, ah, input, do, 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 system, ah, output. Okay? There's only one output there. There's like 500 over here. Is this, is this wrong? Huh? Yeah, I don't want to get a hit. No. It is simplified. Because realistically, we could have this. Output two, output one. But we may only really care about one of these outputs. Okay, Duncan, you, I'm gonna pick on you here for a little bit because you're new to this class. I haven't been here in a month. <laughs> it's terrible. Um, what we have here is, if all you care about is how much heat this system generates, what this means is, Everything else doesn't matter nearly as much. They're all going to be system outputs. And yeah, you could calculate them all. You could figure them all out. But you're not going to do anything with them. Here, if this is a space heater, you're going to do something with it. And that kind of matters. So when it comes to systems and controls, turns out we have a whole lot of outputs. Let's do another example. Okay, in this example, um, I feel like I use you as an example too much because I was looked that direction. I don't know why. Um, Seth, you're a victim today. You wear your hat forward or backward? Yeah. Thanks. I've seen him wear a hat, though. He wears hats.
Hold on, I'll just give you giant muscles to make up for it. Also, for some reason, you're shirtless. <laughs> Crazy Dave. <laughs> Oh, he's just got massive rippling muscles. That's all it is. Huh? Yeah, I need any one of these. Boy, we should put this much effort into teaching you things, not just drawing pictures of students. It does represent America. But doesn't Seth represent all of us? <laughs> all right, so. Wow, okay, I'll put this, put your hand in a really bad place. I'm gonna have to redraw that one. I hope you guys are drawing this. This will be on the test. Yeah. Yeah, that arm's kind of funny. Your face is funny. This is this is a system. I'm Samuel Peace. Okay, so I'm giving up on drawing this well. And it's a bicycle. There we go. I'm done. I, I gave up. Uh, <laughs> I spent way too much time on the abs, way not enough time on the bike, which was the whole purpose of trying this. <laughs> this is the, bike, the bike is the system I'm going for. Seth was just the victim that I had to draw. Oh, okay, and that ended up on YouTube, nice. So what we have here is we're gonna go with a very simple system of uh, a bike suspension model, okay? You have a rigid linkage that basically connects the wheel to the pedal. Um, and then there is some kind of suspension that pushes on that rigid linkage where Seth's very muscular butt sits on that seat, okay? So if I draw this in a little bit more simple of a mechanism, here's what we have. Shoom shoom, shoom shoom, shoom 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 shoom. And then this one here is rigidly connected to the front tire like that. So we'll say all the suspension is, is in the back, okay? Here there's gonna be a revolute joint that this rotates about, and then you have some kind of spring system there to uh, absorb the shock, okay? Well done. <laughs> okay. So as you know, this is a system. So here, system check. What are our outputs of this system? Okay. We do have heat output. Okay, and here I'm just gonna write it as heat. I'd have to label each one of these components. I don't really wanna go that far. We are generating heat because everything does, especially in a system. You have some heat dissipation. 
Now I didn't draw a damper in here. There isn't a damper in here. Realistically, there should be a damper in here. I'm going to draw a damper in here. Thank you, Jeremy. I should have drawn a damper in there. Because in, the, in a real model, you are going to have a spring that's not just only spring. It's, it's going to have some damping capabilities to prevent, you know, you hit a really big bump and Seth's massive butt flies into the tire. Um, so many gains. <sighs> okay, so we do have heat as an output. What else do we have as an output? There is going to be some amount of sound vibration. Yes. What else? What else is an output? Speed. Tire speed. Okay. What else is an output? We're going to call friction heat for the purposes of this class. Anytime there's friction, it's, it's heat. Just think of it as heat. So it's a different kind of heat. Yes, we could break that into heat from different sources. Yeah, we could talk about the kinetic energy of the bike, the wheel, because the wheel has rotational energy, the bike has translational energy, two different kinds of energy. We could break that into different kinds. And we could talk about Seth's kinetic energy. Okay, but I don't know how you get an infinite mass moving. I think that's an infinite amount of kinetic energy. What other kind of outputs do we have? What's that? We could, we could write momentum in here. It is actually a different, I mean, it's derivable from kinetic energy, but it's unique enough that it could be considered an output. So that's a good one. What else? Spring compression. What else? We could be talking about component rotations. This piece can rotate. What else? I'm going to call that mass transfer. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. I would kneel, but my knee hurts. What else? We could, we could have seat height. That could be an output. Absolutely everything. Okay? Now, question I asked for, oh wait, hold up. Getting ahead of myself. We could actually measure the radiation. I'm not gonna write it up there, but yes. There is an output radiation because everything radiates. All of us, it turns out, contain some small amount of carbon-14, which is radioactive. It's small, but it's still present. <laughs> What is the input to this system? Uh, Seth. Seth. How is Seth inputting into this system? He uses massive gains. <laughs> 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 uh, that's. Leg stumps, because <laughs> I forgot to draw in feet. <laughs> I gave up on the drawing way too soon. I'm so sorry, Seth. Okay, we do have one other input that I think is relevant to this one. Okay, and it is the road profile.
the path that you take is if it's perfectly flat, it doesn't create any input to the system. If it's not, it actually does impact all of these. Now, I have a question for you when it comes to this example. Can we figure out what the relationship is between the input and the output for each one of these variables? Yeah. Zane's feeling very confident. Anybody else agree with him? Duncan, not so confident. What is it, Zane? You had something? Well, I agree. Okay. Zane agrees with Zome. There we go. Wait, you agree with Duncan or with Zome? Zome? Okay. Duncan, this is one time I'm going to have to tell you that you're wrong. Oh, nice. I'm sorry. If you can identify an output, and if you can identify an input, you can determine the relationship between the input and the output. How many of you guys know what a partial differential equation is? Yeah. Partial differential equations exist as a way of determining how one input impacts one output, recognizing that there may be other inputs present. Okay. All right. So in talking about this, systems can be pretty complex. If you have an infinite number of potential outputs, we have some inputs, systems can be very complex. Well, I'm gonna make things a little worse. Jeremy mentioned that there is a radiation output from this system. There's also a radiation input to the system. Not only that, but the temperature outside, despite Seth's massive gains, the temperature outside is going to impact how he pedals the bike. It's going to impact the material properties of the bike itself, as well as of Seth's massive gains. Okay, Seth, if you're 300 degrees Fahrenheit, you're not gonna be able to pedal the bike very well. On the other end, if the bike is close to absolute zero, it's going to shatter as you pedal it. So to say that the temperature outside does not pose an input to the system is false. Because if we were to change that temperature, it would dramatically change the way that the system behaves. Not only is it the outside environment that matters, okay? Seth, you're about to pass by a crowd of people who are all right there, and it's a mosh pit, okay? Everybody's jumping up and down. Those are now causing vibrations in the roadway that do impact your bike behavior. They cause vibrations in the air that do impact you and your massive gains, okay? We can keep going. There are an infinite number, an absolute infinite number of inputs that we can write out here, okay? And that becomes problematic. Because the more inputs we put in here, now all of a sudden it isn't our nice little system input output, it now becomes and I mean there's an infinite number of lines and then there's another infinite number of lines coming out of here. Zane, you said we can calculate this. 
we have to take into account an infinite number of variables in order to calculate this. Duncan, can we take into account an infinite number of variables? No. No, it's, it's mathematically impossible. We could never even write out all of the variables that impact this. What are we even doing in this class? No. <laughs> all right, get your pencils ready. It's time to write to infinity. By the time you're done, you will have died. Um, we're trying to control the outputs. How do you do that when you have an infinite number of inputs? Hmm. Hmm. Now at your level, you may not be able to directly identify which inputs actually are important to a system. That's part of my job to teach you. How do you recognize that? Okay? Realistically, there's an infinite number of inputs. How do you pick the ones that are right? So why you have Christian Mingle profiles. Helps pick it for you. And then you can swipe left. Uh, I've thought about joining Christian Mangle, but no, I don't. No, I'm missing out on the whole world of people who are going to make my life miserable for a little bit and then maybe cook for me. No, I have some I have some pretty nasty relationship stories. I don't want to go into that, especially on YouTube. Um, yeah, no, no. So here, the solution to our problem is we have to be able to recognize what is and is not important, okay? And here's what I'm going to go ahead and say. Anytime you try to identify which inputs matter, you are already creating a model. So as the engineer, it's your responsibility to create models of systems, okay? I'm going to promise you right now, your model will never be 100% accurate. The end. This is what differentiates us from scientists. We deal with this thing that I like to call reality. I'm kidding. Scientists deal with reality too. We just... We, we have to make the assumption that you cannot be 100% accurate. You can't. You can try, and I would encourage you to try. You can get 99.9999999% accurate to where you can almost exactly predict the behavior of a system every time. But you can never get 100%. You can't. Your goal is to get that high accuracy, reduce the error. All right, um, Zom, can I borrow you for a little bit? Of course. We did such a great job holding hands, I want to do it again. On camera this time. Okay. There we go, left-handed, there we go. Okay, so Zane and I are running, we're, we're walking buddies because we're in preschool. We're just walking through parks 
together, the distance between us changes and we're just constantly pulling and pushing on each other, okay? Can I model that as a spring based on how much force we're exerting on each other? Yeah, you can, because anytime I'm holding on to you, I'm either pushing or I'm pulling in some regard. If I'm pushing, you're, we're getting farther away. If I'm pulling, we're getting closer together. We can model that as a spring. Are you like storing energy? Does it matter? I can model it as a spring. Thank you, you can sit down. You bring up a good point. In a spring model, there's some stored energy, right? That's the whole mathematical calculation. That's the whole purpose of a spring is to store energy. Am I really storing energy in my arm or in Zane's arm? No, not really. So I can model it as a spring. My model's not right, but I can. There's nothing gonna stop me from modeling me holding hands with Zane as a spring as we run through the park. What would be a better model? More likely a damper, <laughs> because if we're not moving relative to each other, I'm not really gonna be pulling on him as much. If I'm pulling on him, it's because I'm moving faster than he is, or I'm accelerating faster than he is. That might be a better model. That would be more accurate than a spring. So the question is, can you model anything with pretty much any components, yes. Sometimes you'll get a 0% accuracy rate, nice. <laughs> but you can model anything. And the goal of making models is to get as close to 100% as possible, as far as accuracy goes. It's not even a word. 100% is impossible. So then another question you have to ask yourself is, what is an acceptable amount of error? If I model Zane and I holding hands as a spring, and it can 50% model the actual force relationship if I consider force to be the output that I'm exerting on Zane. If I say that the distance between me and Zane is one variable, and that us holding hands is a spring, and the farther away from him I get, the more force I put on him, the closer I get to him, the less force I put on him. If I model it as a spring, and it has about a 50% correlation with the actual force I'm exerting on Zane, is that acceptable? Depends on your definition, like what you That's exactly where I'm going. If we're doing back of the, back of the napkin calculations, I'm trying to get a rough estimate within an order of magnitude of how much force I'm exerting on Zane. I can put together this model, I can write it out, I can put it in place, I know it's wrong, but it'll give me a ballpark number. 50% is pretty good. Considering it'll take me five minutes to come up with it. Now, I don't know why I would spend five minutes calculating how much force I'm exerting on Zane by holding his hand. But, that's, I mean, that, that example quickly falls apart. <laughs> but it's something I could do. The 50% can be good enough. 95% can be good enough. Can also not be good enough. Okay, if we're talking about, uh, have you guys done linear regressions? Anybody? Yeah. 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 So here, if I have my actual line, and then, so my actual line is going to be the black line, actual. 
And then the system model line is going to be my red line. Okay, is that good enough? Well, what, what, uh, you guys took stats. How do you determine whether or not this is good enough? What value do you come up with? Correlation. Correlation, which is an R value, right? If your R value is over 99%, maybe that's good enough. If it's 80%, maybe that's good enough. You're the one that has to make the decision there. No one is sitting down and saying, you have to get at least 90%. If it's, if it's less than 50%, usually people are saying that's not a real very good model. Even if it follows it very well, but the amplitude is wrong, eh, 50%. Eh. As the engineer, it is your job to determine what is the acceptable amount of error, okay? An R value is one method of measuring error. Because if you get an R value of one, it's like your, your system exactly models the behavior of the system. Your system model and the behavior are identical. If you put together a model and and uh, maybe you're not using our values, maybe you're using percent off error. So here, um, I come up with a model of probability of whether or not Garrett is going to be able to throw uh, free throws, okay? Now, that's a lot harder to apply an R value to that to determine his error, because it's not a continuous function. There's a discrete number of throws that Garrett makes from the free throw line, okay? Maybe my percent error is my model says, given how hydrated you are, given how much sleep you got last night, given how much minutes of practice you've had already today, given how much energy you have right now, according to all of this data, I say you're gonna be able to hit 70%, okay? I have no idea how you play in basketball, but just go with me for this. 70% is a really friggin' good number for anyone. <laughs> Any, most people would. <laughs> okay. If you can hit 70%, great. Now, if I say, according to my model, Garrett can hit 70%, Garrett actually hits 58%. Clearly, that's off. You could say that's a 12% error, or you could take 58 divided by 70, multiply by 100%, and that could be your error. There are a couple different ways to calculate error. So not only what is an acceptable amount of error, but how are you going to measure error is another decision you have to make. Okay, my hand marks are still on the wall. <laughs> uh, I left my mark on this room. It looks like I died. Yeah, I don't want to do that though, because that's a little obvious. This one just makes it look like I, I hit the wall and I fell. It's kind of what I was going for. It was the unicycle. <laughs> Uh, actually, I just bought pads for my unicycle last night. Finally. Should have had them before. So this won't happen again. But I will be bringing that unicycle to this class yeah, at some point. <laughs> I mean, if you want to. Is it yes. harder than riding a board? Yes. A lot, lot harder. Yes. It's like, jump on at the same time. it's like learning a bike from scratch. Oh, it, it, is, it is, the analogy is it's just like learning how to ride a bike all over again. It's, it's easier to do when you're an adult, but it is very challenging nonetheless. You get very frustrated and it requires teaching your body systems how to 
handle the new level of control that you have. It's very relevant to this class, that's why I'm bringing it in. Okay, so system models. Uh, we're not gonna be talking about how to do system models today, but this is something that I want you to consider. When it comes to this class, I am not teaching you 100%. What I wanna teach you how to do is I wanna teach you how to, how to put together a system model I wanna to try to teach you what you can do to make it better, how to improve that model. I also wanna teach you how you can mathematically derive that model. I also wanna teach you how you can solve that model so that you can predict system behavior. And lastly, we're gonna finish with the concept of control where not only are you able to put together this model, predict behavior, but you're able to tweak components inside of the model in order to get what you want to have come out as an output, okay? That is the idea of control. All right, now let's, uh, we're gonna get into, there are two types of systems. And this will be in your reading assignment that's due on, uh, Sunday night, I believe. Let's talk about an open loop system, okay? Um, uh, Gerardo, you play, you play soccer, right? Let's look at the system of you wear cleats, right? Yeah, okay. I didn't want to make an assumption there. I, usually people do, but some turfs don't like cleats. You're wearing a cleat, okay? When it comes to your cleat, it's not a terrible drawing. The goal of the cleat is to minimize the amount of movement between your foot and the ground when you put your foot on the ground and push off, okay? Now, when you push off, there is always going to be a small amount of movement on the ground, unfortunately. Sometimes some surfaces are worse than others, even with cleats, okay? But we can take this and we can make the ground cleat connection a system. We can, and we can get a derived number between the forcing function, which is Gerardo pushing back on his cleat as he takes a step, versus the force that is exerted on the cleat by the ground an input-output function. The output here is you care about how much the ground is pushing on you. The input is how much your foot displaces. You move your foot this far, you get that much force out of it, okay? So here, input X, output F. That's a system. There's going to be a viscous damper motion associated with it, there is going to be a very stiff spring also associated with it. And we can model this based on different displacement profiles, how much acceleration he has. Uh, we can even, we can make this model harder and turn it into a 2D model because you know if you are taking this model and you're displacing in this direction, that's very different from this direction. If you're taking a stutter step, you're gonna have a different force profile than if you're just running straight forward. That's two different things. So we can make this as hard as we want. But here, let's, let's go back to the simples. We're just gonna be focusing on running straight forward, okay? Question, how does Gerardo's cleat know how well it's doing? It's not sentient, it has no clue. It doesn't change its behavior based on the force that's applied to it. 
it's a very rigid cleat, at least hopefully. Hopefully it's not bending or something. This is what's called an open loop system, okay? There's no change to the behavior of the system based on the output of the system itself, okay? What does that mean? That means this cleat behavior does not change if f is larger or f is smaller. Doesn't change. It's the same behavior both ways. All right? Open loop system. Um, most control systems are open loop. You have a question? Yes. Yeah, so if if the output was like a greater force, that would be a, you know, you could be running faster. Wouldn't that be a change? Does that, that change? change the output of a system output behavior? Yes. Because the system behavior, that model that we created, isn't going to be impacted by the force. I mean, yeah, you'll have greater input. You'll end up with a greater displacement, greater force profile. But it requires that greater displacement in order to get a greater force profile. You can't change the force profile based on the force profile itself, if that makes any sense. Okay. Do all of you have a page that you can draw on? Okay. I'm going to draw a picture for you on the board. And what I want you to do is I want you to copy this picture into your notes. Okay? No, just, you could take probably half a page. I'm going to have you draw two different drawings. You could draw them next to each other. Okay? I want you to draw this. You can make it as symmetrical as you want. It's a box in a box with lines connecting the corners. Okay, go ahead and draw that in your notes. Draw it on one side knowing I'm gonna have you draw something else on the other side of the page. You have more than enough space, Zach, you're good. I'm just deciding if I need All right, before we go on, just a quick question. Do you think that you drawing this was an open loop system? Your pencil didn't know how well it was doing. Now here's what I want you to do. It looks like everybody's done. On the other side of your page, close your eyes and draw that again. It's bad. Actually, that's not bad. <laughs> okay. Now, here's the question I'm going to ask you. Did you know whether or not you were drawing exactly what I drew the first time? Is your drawing pretty close to this the first time? Yeah. It, it is. Why? Because the output, the movement of your pencil, you can see it. You can see where it needs to be, and you can actually determine. It's, it's a very fine control system that your brain has that tells you whether or not you are falling off of where you need to be. When you close your eyes, you have lost that feedback. 
Your behavior no longer depends on what you're doing. You're just simply repeating a motion that you have already done. When you close your eyes, a lot of what you do ends up becoming an open loop system. You are doing things because you know you've done them before and you just do it, whatever. When it comes to drawing, you don't know whether or not you did a good job in your drawing. You have no way of identifying it without looking at it or trying to feel it. Most systems are open loop. Humans are incredibly, have that incredible ability to not have to have an open loop system. We actually have multiple sensor systems in our body that prevent us from being open loop control systems where we're just doing stuff and have no idea how good they are. Okay, when you go to a, a vehicle suspension, vehicle suspension is, a, is an open loop system. It doesn't know whether or not it cracked itself. It just keeps doing what it was designed to do. It doesn't change, okay? A cleat is an open loop system. It doesn't change. It doesn't know, it's, as Duncan says, it's not sentient. But then we, add, we bring in the second type of system. And this is what's called a closed loop system. And this is going to introduce a topic that we're going to talk about more next week. In a closed loop system, let's give an example, okay? Um, let's see. Actually, artificial intelligence is, it, it requires an element of closed loop systems. So yes, thank you. But I'm looking for a, a different kind that's, that might be a little bit more, uh, um, oh yeah. Okay, everybody have their phone on them? Go ahead, pull your phone out, put it on the desk in front of you, okay? Okay, now keep your screen on. Sam's doing a great job. <laughs> Tell me, does your screen brightness change when I shut the lights off? Yep. Mine's auto adjusting, so yes. Mine also auto adjusted. So now if I turn this back on, does your screen brightness change? <laughs> that's, that's a little different. This is what's known as a, a closed loop system. If you have your phone in a very tight space, the light from the phone itself can actually cause your phone to dim. Did you know that? It has to be in a very closed space. You can do it yourself where its own light can impact whether or not it's on. It has a measurement that measures the light in the system overall. But because the light from your phone is contributing to the light in the room, it has the ability to detect whether or not it's too bright. Kind of a fun feature. I got what you said. That was good. That was props to you on that one. The best kind of jokes are the ones where it takes me a second to figure out it was a joke. <laughs> oh, that's good. So here, in a closed loop system, there is some way in which the system is capable of monitoring its own output. Here, for the phone brightness, it has the ability to detect its own brightness because if you were to shine lights at it, it's the same thing as reflecting its own light off of itself to measure that light output. Huh? The first drawing was the closed loop. The first drawing was the open loop. 
Oh, this one? Oh, yeah, yeah, the first, the first one was the closed loop, the second one was the open loop, yeah. Sorry, I thought you were talking about like this first drawing. Yeah, so you have the ability to monitor the output. And as a result of monitoring the output, the system actually changes its own behavior. Okay, so here in a cleat, the cleat does not itself change. What you could do is you could put an actuator in your cleat so that if your movement that you put in is not producing enough force because maybe that ground is really soft, the cleats themselves move to increase the force that's put on the ground, okay? All that does is that immediately takes it from an open loop system and turns it into a closed loop system. You now have an intelligent cleat. As Duncan said, this is an AI system. This is the foundations of AI. This is what makes artificial intelligence. And, sorry to say this, this is all that's needed for someone to say that a system is artificially intelligent. That's it. it it's another word for a closed loop system. It's really stupid. I hate that. I really hate that because artificial intelligence is supposed to be something cool, but it comes down to like my phone dims when its own light shines in its light sensor. Artificial intelligence. And in today's world, that's how it's used. So, all right. We're gonna talk more about systems and controls moving forward. Um, we have a lot of stuff to, co uh, to cover, uh, but we've got a few more definitions. This system takes feedback. Next week we're gonna be talking about feedback, okay? All right, uh, you have an assignment due Sunday. You have two assignments due Sunday night. Zach has like nine assignments due Sunday night. Jeremy only has two. Um, have a good weekend, unless I see you tomorrow. And uh, let me know if you need anything from me. So, all right. <laughs>